that's a good one. <laughs> 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 I love that. This time of year, I want to grab for it. Continuing to talk about uh, um, Judges this morning, we're going to be in chapter 6, if you're following along with your Bible or your scripture journal. Uh, uh, I don't really have many announcements. Uh, BBS is coming up, which is the last week in June. And uh, another idea has been uh, thrown out there this week, um, as we've been talking about looking for an opportunity to, to sponsor as a group. Um, we were talking about uh, the possibility of maybe just something a, a lot more local than some of the other choices that we talked about where we were talking about the, the ATL's voice, which is Jason Cantrell. He's a local um, uh, missionary for the preborn, and he had came and met with us uh, a year ago, and, and, uh, and we'd, we'd uh, you know, supported him then, and, and maybe we could we could look at it as an ongoing thing. I don't know if any, if you guys follow him or don't follow him, um, bonus points for you, Tracy. He really makes <laughs> Bonus points for Tracy. She, she follows him. Yes. Mine too. Yeah, okay. See, I, I was gonna say I, I've heard that one. So that, that's that's a good one. He goes to their birthday parties. The one that he saves, he goes and visits some of the birthday parties out there. Yeah. It's like it's when like it's a rough job. When you see his stuff, like it makes me feel bad. Like he, I'll, I'll get on there and he's like he's been there since six o'clock in the morning. It's dark outside and like he's there every day. People and grind. Man, they're constantly they're going right. crazy at me. I, I feel like for me, uh, you can see somebody through their through their you know efforts through their crew. Man, when he was going to uh, birthday parties, he went to so many one-year-old birthday parties. Like, it's awesome. You know? And what's weird about him is when he came and spoke here, he's so much like an introvert. Yeah. It means there's so much he an is. extrovert out there. Yes, he yes. is. It's like a whole different person. It's like a God thing. For yeah, I watch it a lot. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, but he's so, he's so different in personality as when he was here compared to what he does there. I mean, yeah. No, that's, that's excellent. Yeah. It's the Holy yes, Spirit. I agree. I agree. One of my favorite things about any type of street preacher is when they engage the hostile, are they able to be calm? You know, and for me, 98% of the time, he is very, very calm, and he doesn't come back in some kind of a, you know, uh, come back at you kind of a way. You know, he's just like loving. And, Let's back into Jesus. And yeah, man, it's, it's very good for me. So that's an excellent one. We will we'll move that to the top of the list. Uh, continue praying about that, though. We'll, uh, we'll make a decision here um, in three or four years. Scott, Scott Reynolds is upset with me because it's taking me so long. But I do feel like I, I want some support. And I feel like right now like we had some good, you know, connectedness. 
if you don't follow him, he has two different accounts on Facebook. He has his own personal account, Jason Cantrell, then he also has ATL's voice, um, the Atlanta's voice, um, and, and he has some cool videos and stuff on there if you ever get the chance to, to look him up. But so, uh, we've got that, we've got our BBS, and, uh, and we'll get right into uh, the Book of Judges. I'll, I was already a little bit late there this morning. You got to be in prayer throughout our um, uh, time here together for the music this morning. It's going to be, it was tough. It's like a tough song, you know? So, we'll see about that. But um, we just got finished finishing up chapters four and five, uh, the story of uh, Deborah and Barak. And uh, Barak followed Deborah, Deborah followed God. Um, it's a famous quote there. Uh, we, and we talked about the, the prose of chapter four, the poetry of chapter five, and last week we discussed the, the victory hymn of chapter five. Um, in many ways, the Song of Deborah is the theological hub of the book. Here God is worshipped and praised with a wonderful focus on God's intervention on behalf of his people, E.A. Carson. Um, and and there's, there's so much to be said. We just left last week on a high. I think on a, on a high with Israel's relationship with God, where they were. Of course, we leave with the, the 40 uh, years of uh, rest for the land. Uh, but we sang to the Lord. You know, on that day, Deborah and Barak sang this song. Israel's leaders took charge, and the people gladly followed. Praise the Lord. Listen, you kings. Pay attention to the mighty rulers. For I, sing, I will sing to the Lord. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Israelites are victorious. They're, they defeat the evil king Jabin, the oppressor from Hazor, and uh, uh, Sisera, the commander of the army. And, um, and, and, and we're, we leave on a high. And of course, as you turn the page in the book of Judges, every single time, you're going to find yourself on a low. Um, so that's where we are this week. Uh, a couple of interesting facts that we missed. Um, one of them that I, that I think is very unique about Deborah's story is uh, when Barak, when he goes and he musters that army um, it, for, that, for the battle, gosh, that's small. Anyway, so imagine if it's really big, you can like, read it. Um, but he, he musters 10,000 warriors. And that's the most that have been mustered up to this point in the Bible, which is very, it's very unique. You know, that's a very cool thing. Why so many? That's, that's a good question. Super contrast to many other stories that we're going to get into. Um, but that is, that's the largest one that's been assembled so far. Another interesting uh, thing is there's this rabbinical view of, of the battle itself. In verse 20, it said, the stars fought from heaven. The stars in their orbits fought against Cicero. And there's this... Uh, there's this Israelite war poetry going on here, um, where there's no report of, uh, of valor, or outstanding, you know, um, men on the field who one on one fettered the, the other, you know, the enemies. There's this divine intervention, and that's that's what is winning the war. Um, the stars are fighting on behalf of Israel. I think that's awesome. And we talked about, you know, in songs we we try to make more. Of, you know, grand illusions and all these kind of things, and, and that's exactly what's going on there. Another example, that's in verse 21, where it says, the Kishon River swept them away. That ancient torrent, the Kishon, march on with courage, my soul. And the river, here again, nature swept them away. Um, that ancient torrent, I like that. Uh, the river is a character in the battle acting on behalf of Israel. Um, and swept who away? Swept away the 900 iron chariots of Sisera, um, which is an allusion to Exodus 14. Um, that's, that's what you're kind of supposed to see here in this battle is, you know, the Kishon River's ancient torrent swept them away, exactly like in Ex Exodus 14, verse 27. Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the water rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them in the sea. Um, an absolutely supernatural event, you know, that's, that's another detail that they throw in there. Um, and one last detail is a, a supernatural detail, which is very, it's a very unique line, and uh, it's easy to skim over. It's in verse 23. Uh, Let the people of Moroz be cursed, said the angel of the Lord. Let them be utterly cursed, because they did not come help the Lord. To help the Lord against the mighty warriors. And then we're like, well, who with the folks of Moroz, clearly they didn't do well here. Clearly, though, they were in a place where they could have given uh, an opportunity. They were given an opportunity they could have helped, um, clearly. And then they turned their backs on the Israelites in some way. Uh, Moroz is this unknown city, this unknown people group, 
Um, and uh, this, this is their only mention in the Bible, uh, which is very unique. Um, the, um, the angel of the Lord comes, uh, which is another, another unique thing. Um, it, it has, uh, right after it mentions that, and, and he's cursing them, because they were cursed by the angel of the Lord, and obviously didn't make it out of the book of Judges. I like that when Daniel Block says that. Um, but, you know, and we've talked about the angel and the messenger of the Lord, and we've kind of reviewed him, and we're going to get to him again today. He, he's part of our chapter 6. Uh, Melech Yahweh, the envoy of Yahweh, the messenger of God. Um, he's, he's not in chapter 4. He's not in the narrative part. But here he is in the psalm. And, uh, and for me, I like discussing different interpretations. Know? And when we when we brought him up in chapter two, I kind of brought this up a little bit, but I think this is an excellent place to kind of challenge yourself with it. Um, we're discussing different interpretations of the messenger of the Lord, and we said that some people interpret him as Jesus in this pre-incarnate form. He is Jesus. He's just here before he gets here to some degree. You know, uh, that is that is a very common thought, um, and I don't feel like that that conflicts with anything. You know, for me, it's okay if that's your question. You know, I will say I, I, I held that view for, for many, many years of my life. Um, I'm, I no longer hold it, but that's okay. I don't want to go into any of that. But um, th that's, one, that's one take of who the angel of the Lord is. Uh, another take is he is the supernatural being. He's a specific angel who comes to deliver specific messages at specific times in the Old Testament. Um, another one is he's a different angel of the Lord each time. He's here to wrestle with Jacob. He's here to rescue in the fiery furnace. And he's here to do this. And these are three different guys. So you can look at those any way you want to. But lastly, another view is he's a prophet. He's just a man who speaks on behalf of God, just like any other prophet would. Um, he is delivering messages on behalf of Yahweh. Um, just he's, he's, a, he's an angel. He's a messenger of God. So those are a few different looks. Um, I, I think this one's a little challenging here in this one spot, but man, I, I do like the third interpretation here. Um, not only that, but I, I feel like it, it, uh, it makes more sense to me if Deborah's speaking. If you look at this like Deborah's there, she is speaking, delivering messages on behalf of God. We've already established that. She is the prophetess of, of Israel. Um, I, I really like that. I don't know. You, you can look at it any way you want to, but that's a, that's a good uh, challenge for you there to, uh, to think about. But one last detail is we discussed the ancient uh, trash talking last week, which is the close of the song. You know, there's no way you guys are going to leave unless we, we get on you a little bit, you know. Uh, we, uh, we can see Sisera's mom. She's looking out the window. She's waiting for his return. She's, uh, you know, crabbing a river, you know, all these trash talking type things that you'd say to Sisera's mom. Um, and, and that was a very common verbal talk. Um, but I wanted to highlight a very interesting line right there in that one part. Uh, keep in mind, these are still like victory. This is a, our victory song. We've won. Um, we, hey, man, it couldn't get any better. We see sister's mom over in the window. She's still waiting on him to come back, you know? Uh, in verse 28, from the window, sister's mother looked out. Through the window, she watched for his return, saying, why is this chariot so long in coming? Why don't we hear the sound of chariot wheels? And her wise women answer, and she repeats these words to herself. So she's there, not alone, but with her handmaidens. And they answer her. She keeps repeating these words over and over to herself. I like it in this light. She's kind of going crazy, kind of like insane type of mumbling to herself. These same words over and over and over. Um, they must be dividing the cash of money. That must be what they're doing. Uh, with a woman or two for every man. There will be colorful robes for Cicero and colorful embroidered robes for me. Yes, the plunder will include colorful robes and, and embroidered on both sides. And she's just kind of saying this over and over, um, you know, until <laughs> dot, 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 you know. Um, but the fact is that she's talking about the plunder of war. And uh, we, have no, we have no relationship to this because in our present day, we don't, we don't do that. No. We don't realize that most of the plunders of war in the last hundred years have all been oil. But, uh, didn't say that out loud, moving on. Um, but, but she is first saying that they're dividing up the Israelite women amongst themselves for plunder. That's, that's what she's saying Sisera and his men are doing. 
Um, as a reward, they're going to bring home bedmates, maybe two for every man, just to, sh to show um, their, their, you know, their rule over them by pressing them down. That's that's what they're going to to benefit. Um, she rants about these elegant furnishings that they will be bringing back to her and her handmaidens, since Cicero will win the war. Where is he? I can't hear the sound of his of his chariots returning. It's not like we could possibly lose. We would then become the sex slaves of them. But that is exactly what's going on here. There is this there is this back and forth here where she will find herself in the same position that she's hoping that everyone else finds herself. It's, it's very uh, it's very we're unconnected to it in 2024, you know, but that that is. Uh, What's going on there? It's a very complex, uh, well-constructed lyric in the end of a victory hymn, you know. But and then we end with verse 31, saying, "Thus let all your enemies perish, O Yahweh, but let those who love Him be like the rising sun in all its might." And the land was quiet for 40 years, and the land had this peace for a whole generation. And that's where we'll close today. Or that's where we'll get started today um, with chapter six. Uh, we'll, we'll open in prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to, to open your word. Uh, we ask that you also open our minds as we study your word this morning. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Uh, challenge and change us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. So, definitely my favorite section. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I, I find chapter 6 and 7 and 8 as just uh, terrific stuff. I, I don't even know. Um, there, there's no more... Um, uh, entertaining section for me, and and also, man, there's so much relatability for me in this one. You know, um, can we relate to each one of the judges? Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe not Samson, but like most of them, you know. Um, but I, I feel like this is a this is an excellent section. Hopefully, um, you're going to get more out of it than than you would. Um, you know, typically I I do feel like a, a funny thing this morning is in Daniel and, and Sarah's class, they're doing Gideon, you know. Uh, for the three and four year olds, and I'm like, probably gonna be a little different view than what we got going on, but that's okay, you know, that's good. Um, but no, um, and for, for an outline though, I like we, we look at the first six through eight as Gideon and the Midianite crisis. That's, a, that's an excellent name for that. And then chapter nine is Gideon's son, um, Abimelech, Abimelech, uh, Abimelech, and then he's against the Shechemites, and you have these two. In, and although this verse, I mean, chapter 9 works by itself, the author's going to show us that those are all the same part. Um, so we'll, um, we'll keep that in mind as we go through the next several chapters, which um, we're probably not going to get through today. But uh, one thing to keep in mind is um, uh, how we left last time. How we left last time, and we, we closed that page on this high. We are triumphant. We're, we're victorious. I see sister's mom over in the window. Um, we're, we couldn't be doing any better. We, um, Deborah's awesome. She's this hero, uh, heroine. Uh, she's very heroic, and uh, she has this awesome song about her that we're singing. She's this woman of Israel, and, and she arose the mother of Israel, uh, the, the song says. Israel's saved, and it's at peace, and she's never affected by the surrounding Canaanite culture. We never, we never went into that with her. We talked about that with all the previous judges, but she has, it has no effect on her. Um, it's not spoken about in her story, but it's still there. Um, and then we, we had this high with the women, and now here we, here come the men. <laughs> um, here we go. The uh, the oppression in the Gideon cycle. Um, and we start off. I'm gonna read the first uh, six verses, and then we'll, we'll get into it a little bit. And the Israelites did the evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that, that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack uh, Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was 
was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. So we have this, I mean, just like opposite ends of the earth here with these two stories. Uh, the six verses before this and then these six verses are just high and low. Uh, we're now to the point of starvation. They're, they're taking everything from us, our livestock, our crops. We're hiding in the hills. It is horrible. You How know? much time is between that? Oh, that, that's a good question. This is after that for sure. Uh, the, the year that's commonly attributed to Gideon chapter 6 is 1249 B.C. Um, so so we're like 40 years past. Oh. What you think about that? Makes sense. Time. This is 40 years. Yeah, it is a long time. Um, so um, we start off with the Israelites mm -hmm. did the evil in the sight of the Lord. We already discussed the evil is abandoning Yahweh and going after other gods, um, which we which we chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. We 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 already discussed this. This is the beginning of each, of each cycle. The result is the Lord sends in an agent of punishment. And in this case, it's the Midianites. And uh, one thing, this, this is an excellent opportunity, if you have your map in front of you, um, to, to see where we are. Um, you know, Gideon, he's the fifth judge. Um, he, he takes place in the, in the region of Issachar, which is shown in green, right there, kind of in the middle of the map is a good way to look at it for me. Um, you know, we start off with Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, and Deborah. And now as we get to Gideon, he, he's kind of right there in the middle. There's the city, and it's called Ophrah. And it's west of the Jordan. Um, it's known for its rich soil. It's known for the, its ability to grow anything at any time of the year. It is a, it's a lush land. Uh, there's olive trees. There's all kinds of fancy things there. Um, and they, they have crops. They have sheep. They have goats. Cattle and donkeys, all just mentioned in this one little passage. Um, but this is where we find Gideon. This is this is his area right here. What's the name of it? Um, um, oh, Ophra is the name of the city that he lives in. Yeah, it's, it's a little leader to it there. Um, and so that's where we find him, and that's where we find his enemies. Um, the enemies that he has going are, are very different than the ones we just fought against. Uh, the Midianites, they are. They're nomads. I like the word nomads. I like I kind of like the word gypsies, but that kind of gives us a little different context, really. So I don't I don't want to go with gypsies. But they are not tied down to anything. They can get up, uh, pick their tent up, and go. They're not they're not this is, they're not the land of these people. They're not from over here. They're just they're just ready to, to roam, you know. Um, <clears throat> wherever they come, they kind of take over. Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you call that? Where in the old days, you could go to somebody else's property and you're just like letting your cows eat their grass. Kind of, I like that. Except that they probably stay too long and they hurt everything. And then they leave. That, that's a good way to look at the Midianites. Um, but they're, they're originally, you know, they, they would travel around the whole desert there, the Sinai Peninsula, Saudi Arabia. Um, but their origin is, is, uh, is very undiscussed to some degree. We always look at them as like these others. But they're they're much more associated with us than we, with, than we think. Um, in Genesis 24, the first mention, Isaac, uh, he's there. Uh, he, he brings Rebecca in to, his, uh, to Sarah's tent, his mom, and she becomes his wife. He loved her deeply, and she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. And then in Genesis 25, Abraham married another wife whose name was Keturah. And we, don't, we don't typically talk about Keturah uh, too much. Uh, but after Sarah dies, he marries <coughs> him again. He marries Keturah. She gave birth to Zimran, uh, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, uh, and Shua. And so they have these six kids, um, and Midian is the fourth born. Um, and then verse 4 there lists all his sons. And um, so he, we are, you know, as Israelites, connected to them. Um, we, you know, they're distant relatives for sure is a safe way to put that. Um, but they're connected throughout the Old, Old Testament. Everything that happens, the Midianites are there. They're, they are a presence. Um, you know, when Joseph uh, is being sold, uh, when the Ish Ishmaelites um, came, who were Midianite traders, um, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern, sold him to them for 20 pieces, then they take him down, and they're the ones who sell him to Potiphar. Um, and then in Exodus, they're out in the desert. Here we come across the sea. Who do we run into first? The Midianites, and here we are fighting against them. Um, so many times they, they run against, uh, run into them, 
Um, even, even right before that, you know, Moses is out in the desert, and he finds himself by a well, which in the Old Testament, if you're by a well, you're going to meet a lady. And um, so he, that's, where he, that's where he meets his, um, you know, his, his wife, um, uh, Zipporah, and, and she is a Midianite, and her father is Jethro, the priest of the Midianites, who we discussed quite a bit in detail. Um, so they're, they're super related, you know, like, I mean, even Zipporah herself being a Midianite, she has been, you know, brought into, grafted into uh, the Israelite line. Um, so, um, <laughs> the traditional view of the Midianites is they look a little different. They're, they're easily picked out. Uh, for me, I believe they have darker skin. They're from the desert. But another good one is I like them as being larger than the Israelites. Uh, taller, stronger, whatever you want to look at it as. But I, I want to even throw this out there to them. Very small. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute, but like they're really small and, and, and they're feisty. It kind of, that kind of works too. But anyway, well, it doesn't really matter how small they are. But um, I'm off on the side tangent now. But but the uh, the Midianites are the first enemies, and then they named the Amalekites. And again, just like that, you know, we we've had the Amalekites um, in Judges three, and you got Eglon. And he's picking up these different groups. He gets the Ammonites. He gets the Amalekites. They're all allies of him. Um, they're from the desert. They've been involved with warring with Israel since the Exodus. Um, and then the last group is a very unique name. Uh, the Sons of the East is our um, is our translation. Yeah, the Sons of the East. Uh, ben Akadem. Um, it's not a proper name. It's not an exact group of people. It just kind of means these other raiders or marauders who, who live out in the desert. Um, they're definitely nomadic people. They come from the other side of the Jordan. And they're not Israel. Um, but all three of these enemies in Gideon's section right here, they're all put together by the same thing. There's one thing that categorizes them all together, and it's their mode of transportation. They all ride camels. Um, what you're thinking, well, doesn't everybody ride camels? No, the Israelites do not ride a camel. There's no Israelite who would ride a camel. Uh, that, is, that is the opposite. Uh, they all ride donkeys. Um, but these three groups, they all utilize the uh, the camel, which is a, which is a, which is a unique thing to this story. Um, another another word that I found, or another title that they would uh, call camels is uh, the ships of the desert. I like that. That's pretty good. They're large. Um, to give you an idea of how large they are, they're the largest creature in Israel. That's that's pretty good. Uh, there's nothing there's nothing bigger than than uh, camels there. Um, there is a there's a one hump. Uh, which I think I had right before that. Ah, it's in front of the Dead Sea, which you can't see, but that's a cool one. But then the other one is like this uh, uh, Bactrian, which means two humps. Um, I, I kind of like the Bactrian better. But anyway. You have to pull people that way. Yeah, you need to stack on another one. <laughs> but um, they sit there, you know, the, the uh, whatever it is, they store fat in the, I don't know, I don't know anything about animals. But anyway. Camel costs a lot of money today. Camel? Wow. You trying to buy a camel? But like renting one? Uh, renting, one <coughs> renting one was so crazy expensive that I thought, well, how much are they? We should buy one and rent it out. You know what I mean? It was like that kind of thing. Yeah, but you'd have to take care of it. Just a quick thought. Uh, did you, did you, uh, did it was like, they're like fifteen to thirty thousand dollars Oh, wow. <laughs> I did not know that. that car. Oh, wow. They go a long ways, though. I mean, yeah. yeah. That, they better for $15,000. They better like so this. So, see, I mean, like, I don't know, but I you know do that. a little research on that. Did you, did you, this has nothing to do with anything. Did you check a pet? Do they have camels? Is that right? Wait, yeah. I can't remember who it was. So we, I think they did, but I think theirs were already renting out for, okay. Okay. anyway, it worked out, but. Uh, That's crazy. It's crazy. This is a 30000 bird. Hey, I think he's very cool. He's like a wolfy kind of. Yeah, he's, got, he's got a lot of options. Yeah, no, that's right. You can do a lot of stuff with this guy. He's got the neck beard thing. Hey, how do they mount them? They run and pull them all up there. Or something. <laughs> don't have that knowledge. I don't have that knowledge. They get on somebody's like, you see 
Yeah. No, they, they, I wrote one before. They go on their knees. Look, they go on their knees and you get a phone. They literally go to their knees. Yeah, they have steps, but they go to their knees. <laughs> You've never rode one, Wes? No, but I've touched a couple. But I've rode one. Good enough. <laughs> and because they, they bend down. Yeah. They get down the ground. Okay, okay. that's how they do it. Larry said they bend down. If you get like a nice 20,000. I'm sorry, the 10, this, I just Googled again. Yeah, 10 to 17,000. So 30 was a little high. Uh, but I think I could have read that before. 30,000 is snap your finger, it bends down. Yeah, thousand. Yeah. yeah. Train. Still, that's a lot of money for one camel. Yeah. Isn't it odd? Yeah, come out in the Middle East. Isn't it odd that even in this class, this is the first time we've ever got the camel? Isn't that weird? Like, you, we think from over here in the United States that they're, they're, they're affecting every... They're very rare in the Bible. Very rare. Um, we wow. look at them like... Are they everywhere over there now in Israel still? Oh, yes. And yeah, they're all over. Like, when you go to Jerusalem, you get your picture taken by it for Ten dollars or whatever you want by. Do they ride? Do they ride them? <laughs>
And uh, hopefully we're all familiar with that. I think we all live out far out enough in the country to have, uh, to have encountered uh, the noises of cicadas this year. Um, it's, it's a very strange thing that we have in Georgia where we have these two groups of cicadas um, that they come out in these strange intervals. One group, uh, one brood comes out every 13 years, the other one comes out every 17 years. And lucky us, in 2024, it's one of the few times where they both come out at the same time. So we have all these beautiful noises from our uh, forests and wherever. Um, it's actually, here's a neat little trivia question. It's the first time since 1803 uh, that that's happened, where they're both out at once. And another weird thing is the next time it happens is 2037. So that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But during this year, there will be hundreds of trillions or even quadrillions of cicadas that are expected in the state of Georgia in the United States. Um, that's an average of one million per acre over millions of acres. Um, they come and they take over. You know, that's exactly what's meant by this illustration here. As, as you know, when the Midianites came in, they're like locusts. They just came and they swarmed us. They just absolutely took over. Uh, thick as locusts. Uh, verse 5 says, these enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous, too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. They ravished the land is another translation. <clears throat> and, and for me... This same hit and attack and run type of strategy is, is used all throughout history to some degree. Um, e even you know in, in present warfare, guerrilla type tactics, where you're not really following any any set military strategy, you you go in, hit them where it hurts, and you come back out. You go in, do what you can, and come back out. Um, it's very much like you know 2,300 years after this, uh, the Vikings. The Vikings, they go to the British Isles. They get them where they're not unprotected. They get back in their ship. They, they sail away. They come back in somewhere else. You, you don't expect them. To, there's no way to predict where they're coming in at, you know? Um, the British all hide. They build castles. They all hide. It doesn't do any good. They're still, they'll hit your church. They'll hit this town over here. It's, it's very much the same type of thing. They just, they're just uh, overwhelming to them. Uh, their day-to-day -day life is, is affected by this. Um, cruel. Uh, and in the same way, the Vikings take what they wanted. That's the same way as the enemies of Gideon. Uh, the enemies of Gideon are the opposite of the en enemies of Deborah. You know, King Jabin, he rules the land from this headquarters. He has Hazor. That's where he's at. Sisera, he's over in uh, Harasheth Hagoyim. He, that's where he lives. That's where, You know where he's at. You have his address, you know. If you're going to mount something, you know, come up with a plan to go get him, you know exactly where to go, you know. These guys are all over the place. They're in your backyard. They're all, they're all over. Um, and they oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Um, oh, oh that, that was the, they, they're oppressed for 20 years. But these three groups, the Midianites, the Malachites, and some to the east there, they're unpredictable. Um, they're not an invading army, but they're this, these ruthless marauders, pillaging the fields, taking the livestock, and so they hide. And it says they make hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. And uh, they act in this very, uh, I, like, I like primitive, but like, uh, don't take that out of context, but it's more like this ancient, hey, I've got to hide where I can, you know? Um, they're going to use the topography of the land to, uh, to their advantage in the fastest way they can. If I crawl in this hole, this camel can't get me in this, in this uh, you know, small cave. Um, it, it, and the power of Midian prevailed against Israel because the, the Midian... Uh, because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. The real word there for these hiding places is den, which kind of gives us another context, uh, you know, applying the den and, and Daniel um, to this to some degree, where here we are, we're, we're hiding in holes in the ground. Uh, foxhole would be another uh, more modern um, use of the word. But um, the Hebrew word for hiding in places is, is den. Um, and then they make these, they, they make these makeshift uh, fortifications. Um, when it says strongholds, unfortunately, we use that word like in the British way, where we're thinking they're building these, you know, architectural structures, and they're going to have, you know, all this um, fancy stuff. That's not what it means at all. It means they are making the best of the land. You know, like the crags of rocks that are sticking up. There's this famous scene in uh, Conan the Barbarian where he's surrounded and he runs in between all these really tall rocks. 
and the guys on horses can't get to him because he's hidden between these. That's pretty good for us. That's kind of what we're we got going on. You're going to make shift quickly as fast as you can and hide, um, using the exposed rocks to hide between. Uh, but similarly here, uh, and then they strip the land bare. And then we'll we'll quickly read through these next couple verses. I think verse six here. Uh, Israel's response to this oppression. I, I, I want to try to paint the, the scene that Gideon's life has been put into. His, his life is, uh, he is oppressed. He is held down. He's hiding all the time. That's exactly where we're going to find him. But in verse 6 it says, So Israel was, was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. For help. Here they are. They're reduced. They're, they're brought down. Um, I like to look at it like they're brought down to a, a, the, the level of grasshoppers to these locusts. That's, that's pretty good. Then they cry out, not out of repentance for abandoning Yahweh and pursuing other gods, but they cry out for relief. They cry out, um, and God answers. And then the next section starts the call of Gideon. Uh, it's 25 verses. We won't get through all of it today. But it is one of the most elaborately detailed sections in the book of Judges. Um, Barak, you know, he has this same, uh, he was called through Deborah, he hesitated. And we have this, we have this little strange, you know, six verse scene. But this twenty-five verse scene is very, very different. Um, it starts off with this prophetic scolding. It starts off with, you know, the angel of the Lord. He comes in and, and he's like, How, what, "What? What are you doing?" <laughs> I love that. Um, he, he's just like exactly like he was in, in chapter two. You know, he comes in chapter two. And he's like, "I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give to your ancestors." Uh, you know, I told you not to make covenants with anybody, but you disobeyed my commands. Why did you do this? So now, you know, these people are going to be thorns in your sides. This is what's going to happen to you. And that's exactly what's happening to you. Um, um, why did you do this? I brought you out. You disobeyed me. And they cried. And then we'll pick up there in verse 7 where it says, When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. But you have not listened to me. Um, super sad. He's all over him here. Uh, the Lord sends this prophet who would be the male counterpart to Deborah. Um, he, he, this one, this one would be—he's labeled as a man, and it starts the—it um, starts this address, uh, which, and as we get into the prophets, uh, they, they call it the citation formula. <coughs> you know, here I am. Uh, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, and then they speak. And as they speak, we are to take that as God speaking through. Um, and that's that's one of the ways you can measure somebody um, as as a prophet. Uh, prophets they use it throughout to start their speeches, and it authenticates messenger as an authorized spokesman for the Lord. Um, his verse, his, his message is verse 7 and 8. Um, this is what the Lord of God of Israel says. Here are these past events. This is what I've done for you. What are you doing? You know, uh, you haven't listened to me. Uh, he gives this full review, just like in chapter 2, of what God's done for the Israelites. And all his past actions. Um, he, here's what I've done. You, you did this again. I did this. Um, and he said, and of course, you know, God said, you'll have no other gods before me. And the speech ends, but you've gone after other gods. You have listened to their voice, not the voice of the Lord. Um, and how will God respond to that? How, what does he do for you? You know, that's, that's, that's where we'll leave today, probably. He will uh, he'll intervene on behalf of his people, um, even if God raises up, uh, raises up a shofet, he raises up a judge. It's not because they deserve it. In no way do they deserve it. Uh, it's an act of grace. Uh, the speech of the prophet is addressed to all of Israel. Starting in verse 11, uh, <clears throat> Yahweh is in contact with one individual. Um, we go from this we go from this large scene, and now we're going to get to this very intimate scene, um, the call <coughs> narrative of Gideon. Uh, Gideon himself, for me, is, he's the unlikeliest of heroes. He, is, he, is, he would never be looked at in any type of a... Uh, Courageous, heroic, I'm going to stand up first type of way. 
Uh, like I said last week, my favorite way to look at him is just the one guy in the room you're not going to pick. You know, I, 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 for our face, I've chosen Paul Rudd in case you guys can't tell what that is. Uh, Paul Rudd is not who you choose as your hero, you know? Um, although, no, we won't even get into that. Although he is a hero in some of the movies he's in. But he's an absolute unguessable person. He's a famous comedian who's an, an actor. Um, uh, if you don't know who he is, um, but his uh, his characteristics are not. Um, I don't know. I, I won't even go into that. But it's not what you, it's not. He's untypical. Gideon himself, his name means hacker. It means to chop off, to uh, to chop down, to fell, uh, like a, like as in a tree. I mean, we'll get to that. That's that's his, uh, that's the end of the first chapter here. But he's from the family of Joash, uh, which is the first thing we, we were told about him which means Yahweh is strong. So right there, you've got this orthodox name, which means, oh, okay, I see I see where he's coming from. You know, his name means uh, chop down some wood, but like, okay, we're at least in Joash's family. Um, it, I feel as if a, a Jewish person, when they get to Joash's mention here, you have a high expectations. Um, he's from the clan of Ebiezer, um, uh, which is a, a, one of the sub-clans of Manasseh. Um, so as we look here, and we find him in Issachar, it's very strange, you know? He's kind of a fish out of water here. Um, so I, I think that's a pretty good uh, thing to keep in your, in your mind about him. Uh, we'll go into the, the call narrative more next week. Um, I don't, I don't want to rush through it, but, but I do want to, if you have time this week, read chapter 6 and 7 as it, as it gives the full call narrative, him discussing with the angel of the Lord um, the scene and uh, his, his awesome responses. Um, but I do challenge you to this. Uh, I think a good, a good challenge is, um, is looked at as a second Moses, which is a very strange way to look at Gideon. Uh, the rabbinical view is he is this Moses type of character. And of course, his role is a little bit different than, than Moses, but like, look at him, look at him like that and see what you think, especially the fact that during his call narrative, as, as he's being called, he's not only hesitant, he's sarcastic. Um, he, he, he has more pushback and more, um, hold on a second, are you sure we're in the right wine press here? You know, uh, he, he gives a little more than just um, three or four comments even. Uh, so we'll get into that next week. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to reveal any of the funny stuff yet. We don't have enough time. Uh, so uh, anybody got any, uh, any comments, questions, angry outbursts? Anybody got any, um, anything to, uh, Anything to throw in on Gideon or camels? or We're all going to go in and buy Spring Creek a camel. We're going to keep it at Larry's house. <laughs> That's awesome. Can I charge away? Can I, can I rent him out? Yeah, $1,000 a day. Yeah, yeah, it would have to be a lot. Is that, is that That's what it is. We should get one. Day. We should get a guy. So, well, i got to rent him out like 15 times to get our money back, you know? Ride on him in a circle for two dollars, you know, or whatever. It'd be more than two dollars for the place. Anyway, um, very good. Next week, uh, we'll, we'll finish the call narrative. We'll have the conversation, and then get in Queen's house. Um, but yeah, again, uh, chapter six and seven in preparation. I don't know if we'll get that far, but we'll try. Um, anybody have any prayer requests today? Anything you want to share? Maybe some praise report. First man and. Scott had some stuff going this week, and, and Gary did, and, and Jeff, how's, how's Mr. Jeff? Good, good. He's doing good. Okay. And Cutting grass? Yeah. Gary, you know, just an old stubborn fellow, you know? Did he say he had a reaction to some medication? Yes, that's, 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 that's exactly right. What's going on? Um, I do, you know, like, he still got issues with his 
Okay. He's got issues. He's yeah, in the sense leukemia. Oh, leukemia. He does. He does. He does. Yes, his squat count's real high right now. He, uh, she's really got onto him. Tara's really got onto him a lot this week, uh, taking care of himself better, you know, and like going to these appointments only helps you take care of yourself better, you know, and like I do, I do understand, you know, like the guy perspective. I'm not too tough, you know, type of thing. But I mean, definitely helpful. The glass and tests ran at times, you know. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, we will, uh, we'll pray and then we'll be dismissed. Yeah. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for bringing us in here this morning, opening your word to us this morning, uh, revealing yourself to us through your actions and your words. We ask that um, you help to help us in applying these to our own lives. Learn more about you. Uh, we ask that you bless the service this morning and, and use it uh, for your will. It's in your name that we pray. Yeah, quit throwing that phone around. That thing's expensive.